Good afternoon. Thank you for taking the time to join us for what I promise will be a provocative, enlightening, and engaging presentation on the future of medicine, aging, and longevity. To set the mood for the next hour, I would like to remind you of a few famous quotes on aging. Gertrude Stein said, we are always the same age inside. And Walt Disney said, laughter is timeless. Imagination has no age and dreams are forever. Now, after hearing these, hopefully we can embrace the aging process and learn more about how to not only live longer, but also healthier. This is where you may already be drawing connections between how focused ultrasound and aging can be related. Our current healthcare system has been positively transformed by significant advances, such as CRISPR and the development of various immunotherapies. However, there has been lack of advancement in healthcare innovation specifically for older adults, which leads to continued suffering and disability. From head to toe, I can mention a few diseases and highlight them. Last week, Biogen announced it's pulling Adahelm from the market, underscoring the fact that there has been no significant progress in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease, which affects more than 6 million people in the US alone and many other neurodegenerative diseases. The risk of developing pancreatic cancer increases with age, and yet the disease is elusive, and even the newest treatments result in an overall 11% five-year survival rate. Patients with pancreatic cancer spend much of their lives after diagnosis undergoing surgeries with continued pain or suffering from the side effects of toxic medications. The risk of prostate cancer also increases with age, and the current standard of care treatments are associated with numerous side effects. Finally, half of all people over 65, which is about 27 million people in the US alone, have arthritis, which is associated with pain or decreased mobility, and the dependency on opioids has created its own unique public health care epidemic. Our educated and energetic baby boomers want to stay active and contribute meaningfully to society. They want their quality of life to equal their quantity of life. You will learn more in the next hour about why we need to do a better job in matching our health span and brain span to our lifespan. Now, focused ultrasound is a completely non-invasive therapeutic technology that has the potential to improve the lives of people by using ultrasonic energy to target tissues inside the body without incisions and without radiation. What is incredibly exciting about focused ultrasound is that the mechanism of action is vastly different from other existing technologies and thus has the potential to treat diseases that currently do not have any good treatment options, such as Alzheimer's disease. Focused ultrasound can provide an alternative to current chemotherapy treatments by spatially targeting drug delivery precisely into the tumor itself, avoiding off-target systemic side effects. Importantly, focused ultrasound can also treat pain from a variety of sources and obviate the need for opioids. And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker who is uniquely positioned to give us a glimpse into the future, to forecast the implications of rising longevity on healthcare and explain what role a disruptive medical technology like focused ultrasound could play in coping with the massive societal changes wrought by the age wave. Over the past 40 plus years, Dr. Ken Dykwald has emerged as North America's foremost visionary and original thinker regarding the lifestyle, marketing, healthcare, economic, and workforce implications of the age wave. Ken is a psychologist, gerontologist, and best-selling author of 18 books on aging-related issues, including his two latest, What Retirees Want, A Holistic View of Life's Third Age, and his memoir, Radical Curiosity, One Man's Search for Cosmic Magic and a Purposeful Life. Ken also conceived and hosted the innovative new American Society on Aging series, The Legacy Interviews, featuring interviews with the legendary pathfinders of the field of aging and airing on PBS this fall. Since 1986, Ken has been the founder and CEO of AgeWave, an acclaimed think tank and consultancy focused on the social and business implications and opportunities of global aging and rising longevity. His client list has included over half the Fortune 500. He has served as a fellow of the World Economic Forum 
and was a featured speaker at two White House conferences on aging. American Demographics honored him as the single most influential marketer to baby boomers over the past quarter century. And he was honored by investment advisor as one of the 35 most influential thought leaders in the financial services industry over the past 35 years. During his career, Ken has addressed more than 2 million people worldwide in his speeches to corporate, association, social service, and government groups. His predictions and innovative ideas are regularly featured in leading media worldwide and have garnered nearly 15 billion media impressions. And now I am proud to welcome Dr. Ken Dykewald to share his knowledge and perspective on aging, longevity, and the future of medicine. I'm sure you will enjoy his talk. Ken, the floor is yours. Thank you, Susie, and thank you everyone for taking time out of your busy schedules to take a peek with me at the future of health, medicine, aging, and longevity in our post-COVID world. Uh, I hope you enjoy some of what I've got to say. I'm going to invite you to take all the things you currently think about these subjects and just kind of put them to the side for a little while and allow me to kind of tell you a slightly different version of the story as it occurs to me. First of all, this idea of searching for the fountain of health is not a new idea. It didn't begin in the last decade or two. It's been going on as long as humans have been aging. Um, you know, some of you may realize that way back, uh, the early basis of Taoism had to do with trying to rid the body of its impurities so that people who prayed or who meditated, or who practiced certain things uh, could live forever didn't really work, but it, it drove a lot of people to try to do certain things a certain way. And then in the West, we had our alchemy. A lot of people think the idea of alchemy was to turn straw into gold. No, it was actually to rid the body of its impurities so that it wouldn't age or ever become sick. That alchemy led to chemistry. Chemistry led to medicine, led us to the discussion we're having right now. And then, of course, uh, geopolitics came into play and interspersed with wealth. And I'm going to return to that theme in a little while as wealthy emperors and kings and queens uh, didn't like the feeling of growing older. So they sent explorers out to try to find fountains of youth and magical elixirs. By the way, none of these pursuits really led to much of anything. Uh, it was really the beginning of the 20th century as we had the arrival of public health, where all of a sudden, for the first time, we began to make an impact on illness, on disease, by eliminating germs and some infection through these public health departments, by cleaning our streets, by doctors washing their hands. Uh, many people were spared the misfortune of infection and death, and so life expectancy began to rise. We had extraordinary breakthroughs in the 1920s with the arrival of antibiotics, and all of a sudden, penicillin was found to be something that could knock out illnesses and diseases, infections that would have terrified our grandparents and caused them uh, to experience terrible illnesses and likely death. So some of you, the younger folks on this call, and I know we've got people from all over the world on this call, may not know what this is. You may think it's some kind of a weird video arcade. No, actually, these were iron lungs. And if you look carefully, there, there's an individual in each of these iron lungs. This was poliomyelitis, rampant for decades, heated up in the 1940s. And for people who were stricken with polio, many had to spend their entire lives in these chambers, having them breathe for them. And they encountered the world through an inverse mirror that was over their head. Some people thought, Oh my goodness, more and more people, more and more polio, more and more contagion. The future is going to need a lot more iron lungs. Well, fortunately, in the same period of time, a few individuals, particularly Jonas Salk and Dr. Sabin, came along and said, no, we got to wipe this disease out. And in 1953, there came to be a vaccine so that we could stop polio. Now, keep that in mind, because I'm going to return to that in a little while when we talk about Alzheimer's and how today many people think we've got to be more uh, hospitable and kind and empathetic to folks with Alzheimer's. And I guess I'd like to say, no, we ought to try to wipe the disease out. But hold on that. 
Then, as the end of the 20th century rolled in, the arrival of holistic health and preventative medicine and the realization that how we care for our own bodies could ultimately affect our health level and maybe even our longevity, as for the first time in history, the predominant illnesses were ones over which some type of lifestyle choice or decision, whether it be about exercise or managing stress or vitamin supplementation uh, or rest, could have an impact on our health and well-being. And so we saw the field of health widen to include more and more of these lifestyle practices. And then, of course, we've also witnessed breakthroughs. We haven't yet seen the full impact of these breakthroughs where we began on a new journey, kind of an exponential journey of cracking the code, of trying to understand the code that writes our DNA prognoses for our own future and for our proclivity towards either health or certain kinds of illness. Also, we saw the arrival of an extraordinary pharmacopoeia inventory where, for example, my dad was kept alive till 93 because of medications he took for his heart health problems and for his diabetes and his macular degeneration. And so if not for these pharmaceuticals, my dad would not have known my children. But then along came this mutagenic coronavirus, and all of a sudden we are back in an era of contagion that most of us had never lived through. At the same time, Speed became a factor. One of the major, for me, engines of trying to battle coronavirus was this notion of speed, of using machine learning, of artificial intelligence, of pooling resources, of the world working together to try to race quickly towards breakthroughs. And I think that speed will not go away. It is now a part of how we think about breakthroughs. It's part of how long we think it should take to find cures or treatments. Keep that in mind. Now, look with me here at this chart of the average life expectancy over the past thousand years. And what I'm continually struck by is that up until around the 20th century, uh, most people didn't live very long lives. That living to 30 or 40 or 50 was considered a, a standard accomplishment. Now, there were some people who lived to 70 or 80 or 90, but they were very few. 80% of the population died before they reached their 65th birthday, whereas today, 80% of the population lives beyond their 65th birthday. And so the life expectancy soared during the 20th century, up to, by the year 2020, 78.5. By the way, unfortunately, during these last few years of COVID, it has backtracked a bit to 77 on average. But there are many geroscientists who now tell us that because of impending breakthroughs, some of which I'm going to mention in a few minutes, uh, half of all the kids born this year may very well live past their 100th birthday. And there will be some of you watching this call uh, who are participating in various fields of science who may live to see your 150th birthday. Now, how do we feel about longevity and aging? Let me throw a twist into the storyline here. If we go back to the signing of our Constitution here in the States, uh, when the average life expectancy was only 37 and the median age was 16, I want you to take notice of the fact that all these folks in this painting, first of all, were men, which was interesting, maybe even peculiar, but they were wearing white wigs or they had powdered their hair white. Why? Because they wanted to look older. It used to be the belief that older people had the mojo, older people had wisdom, older people had the possessions, the wealth, they owned the property, they had the power, and they were maybe even selected by God. Before we had a germ theory of disease, uh, many people speculated that if you had lived to your 60th or 80th birthday, it was because God wished for you to be around longer. And so there was sort of a glow of power around older people. Even in Great Britain today, the barristers wear the white wigs. But let's come back to the plot line here. This is a chart of the average life expectancy at birth, not over the past 1,000 years, but over the past 100,000 years. Medical anthropologists now tell us that throughout 99% of human history, 
the average life expectancy at birth was under 18. So what I want to say to you is that while we're tracking all sorts of other changes in the world, this longevity revolution has never happened before. Everything about it is new. Everything. Have we designed our automobiles to accommodate the needs and reaction response times of 80-year-olds? Have we designed our public lighting for the eyes of 70-year-olds? Have we designed our medical system for chronic degenerative diseases of people in their later years? Is our media reflective of the fact that we're living longer and longer lives, or is it still youth-driven? So we're in the midst of an extraordinary change, the arrival of longevity, something that was sought for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and we may not be done yet with the breakthroughs that we're going to see. This may surprise you, but two-thirds of all the people who have ever lived past 65 in the entire history of the world are alive today. One of the questions that a lot of folks are scratching their heads and are asking is, well, when are we old anymore? I know my grandparents were old if they lived when they were maybe 60 or 65. You know, Otto von Bismarck picked 65 to be the marker of old age in Germany in the 1880s when the life expectancy in Europe and the Americas was only 45. So what should old be today? And is the number 65 obsolete? I was taken 20 years ago uh, when John Glenn announced he was going to go back up into space at 77. In fact, I was asked by CNN if I would provide some commentary on this very extraordinary moment in, in kind of aging history. And I knew Glenn. I testified uh, beside him before the Senate. And he was a tough guy. So I watched his first few interviews. And a lot of the young reporters were kind of poking at him. You know, don't you think you're a little old for this? And shouldn't you be puttering around the house? And what if you have to go to the potty? And what if your head blows up? And, and it was clear that they were not okay with the idea of a 77-year-old astronaut. But Glenn turned to these young reporters and he said, hey, just because I'll be 77 doesn't mean I still don't have dreams. And that really made me think because what Glenn was giving a shout out to was the idea that perhaps in an earlier lived history, you had dreams when you were young and then you either fulfilled them or you didn't. And then when you reach 50 or 60 or maybe 65, it was time to kind of go off and play and go to the sidelines. What Glenn was suggesting was, is that if you're in your 70s, you might have new dreams. Maybe you want to learn to play the piano. Maybe you want to start a church. Maybe you want to be an astronaut. Maybe you want to train for a triathlon. But longevity is not simply a matter of people living longer, but it's also the psychology of maturity that what we're seeing is kind of an awakening of the possibilities of life in one's later years. Now, on top of that, there's another force that's taking place that I need to add in before I tell you where I think medicine and longevity and aging and health are going to go. And that is that we had this quirky baby boom after the end of World War II. If you take a notice uh, of this chart, you see that during the Depression and World War II, our birth rate hit an all-time low, historical low at that time. But then 92% of all women who could have kids did. And they had just under four kids. It was actually 3.8 kids each. And so we had this massive baby boom for 18 years following a long-standing baby decline, baby bust. Now, that baby boom became a market boom. So if you happen to have a product or a service that was sitting in front of this huge number of young people and their modern parents, you could make a fortune. Now, I'm going to make a kind of a snarky comment here. In the early 1950s, when Johnson & Johnson, who used to have as their tagline, babies are our business, our only business, that's changed. They had a no more tears baby shampoo. And I'm going to make a really snarky, maybe exaggerated comment here. Boomers came along and there were two things about this generation that our parents wanted for us. First of all, they wanted us to be comfy. They wanted us to have no pain, no discomfort. 
And second, they wanted us to have a lot of middle-class treasures, whether it was a refrigerator or a telephone or one day a Mustang convertible. This is a generation that grew up without a lot of stoicism, with a desire to not feel pain or discomfort, and to have a middle-class dream come true. Our parents wanted that for us. Often I'm asked, uh, is there anything that we don't pay as, uh, enough attention to regarding the boomers? And I will tell you without any doubt, it's the women in this generation. Uh, these are the most extraordinary, multitasking, highly skilled, highly educated women who came along in history. The highest concentration of college graduates, by the way, that has continued over the last decade for every 10 boys that have graduated college. Excuse me, for every 10 boys, there's 13 girls. So the young women, the daughters and granddaughters of these boomer women are becoming the most powerful of our young populations. And I'd like to give a shout out. There might be some folks on this call that were a part of this, but in the late 1960s, the Boston Women's Health Collective was formed at a feminist rally. And often people will give credit to the holistic health or preventative health movements, to Andy Weil or Ken Pelletier, who I believe is on this call, or my friend Dean Ornish. But it was the women at this Boston Women's Health Collective who believed that women ought to be able to control and influence their own bodies and their own health. Although there is still a wage gap, which is, in my view, unjust, women have had an incredible ascension in terms of their income growth, and I also want to say their influence growth. We have women today in their 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s who are powerful, who are forceful, who take themselves seriously, and they do not want to be told by marketers that they ought to look and feel like they're 30 again. They're owning their age. Now, here's an important piece of the puzzle. Historically, we've lived what I'll call a linear life plan. You learned for a while, and you did that once, and it was believed that what you would learn would last a lifetime, and then you worked and raised your family for about 40 years, and then if you had enough uh, extra life, you had a little bit of leisure at the end. We called it retirement. And so I guess the idea is if we're going to have a longevity bonus, that people do everything in the same lockstep and they just get to be old a lot longer. Now, I've been in this field for 48 years, given talks to two and a half million people. I've been interviewed over a thousand times. Uh, I've had lots of discussions with all sorts of people from presidents to world leaders. Uh, and I've not yet met anyone who has said to me, Ken, I can't wait till I'm really old and I, I can't remember things, and I'm incontinent, and boy, would I like 30 more years of that. It's not what people want. They want to take that longevity bonus and intersperse it. They want to be able to be young longer. They want to be middle s or middle-aged for decades. They want to age agelessly, and they'd like to have a chance to continually reinvent themselves. And this will be one of the big changes in terms of how people think of their social and sexual and work lives in a longer lived era. Now, how does this affect economy? How does this affect demography? Well, what I've crafted here are some charts that show each decade, this is the 1950s, and I'm doing this for the U.S., and I know we've got friends from Germany and Israel and lots of countries in the world, and they're very similar chartings. Which age demographic group grew or shrank during each decade? So here is the 1950s. Looking back, would have been a great time to be in the life insurance business or baby food or baby products. 1960s, teenagehood appeared on the scene. 1970s, Boomer men and women entering the workforce, 80s, 90s. This is a 20-year period we have just come out of. And hold on, because I'm going to show you where we're heading. This is the way America and most of the developed nations of the world are changing. And this is the most predictable market force on earth. Now, on the one hand, we might say, wow, 
What's this going to do to pensions? Or someone else might say, if you're in the medical technology business, wow, boom times are coming. Or if you're concerned about health and well-being, you might say, we've got to do a lot better at dealing with the health problems of older people because that's where the growth is going to be. And they're already the primary consumers of health. If you're wondering how this looks worldwide, uh, take a peek at this chart. This is the year 2015, particularly look at Italy and Japan in the magenta co color. Already in those countries, because of low non-replacement fertility and high longevity and an aging, beginning to age boomer generation, those are aging nations. But I'm going to now show you what the world's going to look like in 2050. Right. This age wave is about to transform life on Earth. Now, about 40 years ago, I was a regular on a show called The Merv Griffin Show. I was just a kid. And uh, they said, okay, you'll be on every couple of months. What are you going to talk about? I said, aging. They said, uh, we don't like that subject. I said, how about longevity? They said, great subject. You'll be our longevity expert from time to time. And I said to him, you know, aging, longevity, it's kind of the same thing. They said, no, we like the longevity word better. But back then, very few people were talking about aging and longevity. And now, man, oh man, everywhere you turn, you're seeing longevity ideas, longevity experts, anti-aging conferences, uh, ageless aging workshops. Longevity revolution is just kicking in. Now, often when, I, and I'm uh, fortunate to be a trustee on the XPRIZE Foundation, so I get to hang around with all these kind of future uh, movers and shakers and disruptors. Often people think the future is all about new breakthrough tech. So kind of like the Jetsons, young people with cool tech. This is not really what the future is going to be. I can show you a picture of the future if you're ready. Here it comes. I saw this picture a few years back. The little boy's name is Bradley. He was three. Sitting next to him was his mom, Christina. She's 27. Up behind them is Kathy, the grandmother at 49. Next to Kathy is the great-grandfather, Bob, who's 73. Across from him is Kitty, the great-great-grandmother. She's 95. And believe it or not, in this picture, Sarah Knaus, the great-great-great-grandmother was 118. We are about to have a six-generation society. So I get to speak at lots of conferences and hear all sorts of people talking about we got the old and we have the young. Very 20th century. We got six generations alive at the same time. What about the economics of this age wave? Well, while most marketers and advertisers like to target people under 35, which is very generous of them, it turns out people under 35 are broke and became even more financially disadvantaged during COVID. Turns out that people over 50, who are largely ignored by marketers and innovators and disruptors, have 76% of the total wealth. In the space of health, even though people over 50 make up 35% of the population, they currently, even though these numbers are about to grow, buy 51% of all food and groceries, 52% of all personal care products, 55% of physical therapy, 57% of health club memberships, 63% of lab tests, 68% of all OTC drugs, 74% of vitamins and supplements, 77% of all prescriptions. Now, we recently conducted a massive survey, we being my company, AgeWave, in partnership with the financial firm Edward Jones, and we asked people right now, coming through this COVID experience, what are your greatest financial worries? Health and long-term care costs are retirees' biggest worries today. Out-of-pocket health and long-term care costs. 
And then we asked the same question of pre-retirees, thinking they were going to say inflation or an economic downturn. Uh Uh-uh. What COVID has gotten people thinking about is, wow, I don't really want to be sick. And, And wow, it's expensive. And by the way, not to ruin your day, what are the typical average out-of-pocket costs for a couple who turn 65 in the rest of their life when you add in out-of-pocket health and long-term care? $456,000. So illness is not only unpleasant, it's really expensive. So what have we got? We've got to match health span to lifespan. Let me explain what I mean by this. If we think of life expectancy in terms of the average number of years that people are living, and the potential now is believed to be around 120, but due to breakthroughs I'm going to mention shortly, it could elevate higher than that. We in the United States, even though we spend more money per capita than any other country in the world, we are a very middling country with regard to longevity. Our life expectancy, as I mentioned, is now 77. It's dropped from when this chart was first crafted. And there are 33 countries in the world that live longer than we do. But possibly even more important, our health spans are not very high in this country. So what we've got is a situation where we're living a certain number of years, but we're having a long period of time in which we're aching, we're ill, We're experiencing cognitive decline. We can't walk. We're breaking bones. We're breathing with difficulty. Our hearts are not working well. We have not created a wellness-oriented longevity. And that's a big mistake. So what happens as we age? We have more and more problems. We don't know, I don't know each of you individually, but we're getting better and better being able to, through DNA and biomarkers and health behaviors, to know kind of what you're heading towards. Circulatory problems, arthritis, varicosity of the veins, orthopedic problems, and a whole slew of conditions, which if you're a pharmaceutical company or you're a medical device company, you could be very excited by all these problems. But as an individual, you don't want to have these conditions. And as a nation or as a world, can we afford to have long-lived sick people? And I would say we cannot. And the conditions only rise the older we get. We recently, in the heart of COVID, asked retirees, thousands, What are you most frightened about in terms of your health in your later life? It was not COVID. It was Alzheimer's, dementia. And guess what? It's not only women who have cognitive uh, challenges in higher percentages or people of color who have them in higher percentages compared to Caucasian populations. It's rich people are worried about it because rich people can get great doctors or they can get access to all sorts of medical treatments that other people can't. But right now, they can't buy their way around Alzheimer's. I was watching about a year or so ago a documentary on Bill Gates, and here's a little clip out of that. Bill Gates. What's your favorite animal? Dog. What's your favorite food? Hamburger. What do you eat for breakfast? Nothing. What is your worst fear? I don't want my brain to stop working. Now, Bill Gates' dad died with Alzheimer's. By the way, Donald Trump's father died with Alzheimer's. Um... Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan died with Alzheimer's. So you can have all sorts of power and access, but unless we beat Alzheimer's before it beats us, it could wind up being the sinkhole of this century. So how do we envision healthy longevity? Can we imagine long-lived men and women, us, without illness? And can we build a scientific infrastructure, an ecosystem, And can we build a marketplace? And can we build a medical system that produces not only longevity, but a longevity where our health spans match our lifespans, a healthy longevity? So I'd like to tell you what I think the key elements might be on that path. I only have time to mention a few of my favorites, uh, but hopefully I'll get you thinking and we can have discussions in the Q&A or afterward about what else might be coming down the pike. First, We need medical excellence. 
This may surprise you, but we've got 126 medical schools in this country. There's only 16 full departments of geriatric medicine. And in the last five years, 85% of all the doctors and nurses will have graduated without taking one elective in geriatric medicine. That's unconscionable. By the way, it's unconscionable to me that Medicare itself doesn't require a certain level of geriatric awareness and competency, whether it be in the diagnosis or managing polypharmacy or understanding the complications of multiple conditions, which many older adults have. Where are we in terms of the full-on need for geriatricians? Well, let's use the boomer generation and their history. When the boomers first came along, there were only 3,000 pediatricians. Now there's over 55,000. But get a load of this. We have just a little over 4,000 fully trained geriatricians in the United States. And it used to be 9,000. It's shrinking. Why? Because it's not a glamorous field. We don't get much money if we're a geriatrician. It's one of the lowest compensated specialties of medicine. By the way, the highest is cosmetic surgery. So like, what's wrong with us as a country that we know we're getting older and we want to grow older with health, but we don't skill up for it? Here's another dimension. This is a document that I get each month. Now, this is a weird one for me personally because I became involved in the field of gerontology. I got involved when I was 24, which was 48 years ago. So I wrote my first kind of 15 books before I turned 65. And it's one thing to talk about people over 65. It's another thing to become one yourself. And so I get this each month. And in the upper left, it says, this is your Medicare premium bill. And in the upper right, it says, this is not a bill. Excuse me? How am I supposed to understand that? And, and I'm a reasonably clever guy. You know, I'm Mr. Age Wave. I work in gerontology. Okay. I don't understand Medicare. If you gave me a million dollars in cash right now and, and said to me, all you need to do to get this money is explain part A, part B, C, donut holes, D, I couldn't do it. So we have created a medical system for an aging population that is incomprehensible. Second, wellness and self-care. I think we need to ask what's possible. And I'm going to name the Betty White effect. I really took notice of Miss White when she passed away just short of 100, that people kind of rejoiced in her life. And people said, wow, that's what a 99-year-old could be. She was attractive, funny, witty, sharp, caring, loving. And she wasn't trying to be 40 years old or dye her hair to pretend she was 30. She was owning her age. And I think she set an example for a lot of people to say, wow, and I've got a picture in my mind of a 99-year-old who's a role model. By the way, this is not unimportant. Back in the mid-20th century, it was believed that humans could never break a four-minute mile. And then a medical student, Roger Bannister, broke the four-minute mile. And people thought, this is amazing. We didn't, we didn't know that was possible. But his role model changed the world because within months, other people started breaking four-minute miles. And then within years, thousands of people were running faster and faster. Role models for wellness, for human performance, are critical. Here's one. amazing to see what an 86-year-old body could do. So I also think we need what I'll call precision medicine. And specifically, if we enjoin that with geriatric competence, preventative medicine, a wellness and self-care that's been turbocharged. Right now, it's sort of a 
crazy scene out there if somebody's trying to be healthy. And why am I showing you this picture? Let's use vitamin supplementation as sort of an oddball example. How are vitamins organized when we go to buy them? Alphabetically. That's ridiculous. How's a person supposed to know what supplements they need in this moment in their life to prevent whatever conditions they may have a proclivity towards? So what am I thinking? First of all, I was taken by this device. It's the Toto Bath Toilet. It's a Japanese product. This toilet's got a biolab built into it that connects to the cloud that on a daily basis, knowing who's using the toilet, can analyze dozens, one day hundreds, maybe thousands of biomarkers to be able to guide you in your health decisions. Why should we have to wait once a year to get a handful of tests, which a lot of people don't even do? Why don't we know more about how to guide our health in a positive direction? And the model for that, I'd say, struck me a few years ago when Waze became popular. And I thought, this is amazing. Thanks to AI and GPS, you can decide you want to go somewhere. And that Waze technology, there's now Google Maps and other versions of it, will figure out the quickest, smartest way for you to get there, factoring in everything that might be going on between where you are now and where you're trying to go. I think we could all benefit from a health ways. Why not build a model of the 110-year-old version of a healthy, vital, optimally performing me? And then have a device driven by AI help me make the right decisions. What exercise should I do? What time of day? What food should I be eating? How much sleep should I be getting? When should I be interacting with one specialist or my general practitioner? Or do I need to see an expert at one thing or another? Right now, we're kind of leaving it up to the individual and people have to figure out, should it be Pilates or yoga? Should I do running or should I do rowing? Should I eat a keto diet or should I go on intermittent fasting? It's a madhouse out there. We need AI-driven, a directional system so that each of us could be guided towards our healthiest version of ourselves. There's another dimension to this, and I just popped these pictures in. There are 50 years between these two pictures of me. We need to have the younger version of ourselves realizing that we are making decisions to create the older version of ourselves. And so while it's a good idea when you're 70 or 80 to learn Tai Chi or to improve your diet, the most ideal world would be that if children and teenagers and folks in their 20s learned the responsibility and the skills and information needed so that they could chart a path to the healthiest longevity for themselves and their loved ones. Fourth, Man, do we need scientific breakthroughs. Once again, think iron lungs for polio and then the Salk and Sabin vaccines that led to a breakthrough that changed our lives. So, are we committed to science? No. We are not. This is outrageous. The small amounts of money we spend to fund the scientific research that could lead to breakthroughs so that we won't have all of the problems that I mentioned earlier. It's shameful that we're not doing more. By the way, I know under the Biden administration, there's a movement right now to create kind of a DARPA for health. So fast track disruptive breakthroughs, like the DARPA breakthroughs led to the World Wide Web and so on and so forth. Could we do that in health? And do we, need, do we as a people need to understand that our healthcare system is not about practice only, it's about scientific prevention too. You know, many years ago, I was friends with a, a Princeton economic wizard named Uwe Reinhardt. And at a conference once, he told a story about a man going out for a delightful picnic. And he's sitting all by himself to have a peaceful day, but he sees somebody's drowning in the river that's running in front of him. He runs in jumps into the river, pulls the person out, gives them artificial respiration, saves his life, sends him on his way. Phew. Well, then there's another person drowning. 
and then another person drowning, and he spends his entire day pulling drowning people out of the river until he re realizes there's somebody upstream pushing everybody in. We need to substantially upgrade our scientific intelligence so that we can beat and maybe end some of the diseases of aging. What are some of the areas that I think are most promising? First of all, a universe of what's now being called geroscience has risen up in the last decade, where there are now medications. For example, metformin is being talked about regularly, and about 35 other drugs that are believed to have a favorable effect on the aging process, and therefore strengthen the body's immune system so that the diseases of aging won't occur. We need to keep an eye out for these. We need to help sponsor them. We need to create a healthier longevity through our pharmaceutical sector. And by the way, I will tell you that the billionaires among our population are identifying breakthrough drugs and geroscience, whether it's in Dubai, the Bahamas, Singapore, they want to go just like the early explorers. Where can they go to find their own fountains of youth? But where I sit, we need to make these breakthroughs available for everyone. What else? I think we're beginning to see what will be a crisper future. The possibility of rewriting in an exponential way some of our genetic codes so that we can write cancer out of our future, so that we can write AFib out of our future, so that we can eliminate Alzheimer's from the human experience. We need to support and sponsor these kinds of territories. Okay, so I became enchanted, uh, I guess I'm part of this call today, uh, by Focus Ultrasound this last year, and I thought, wait a minute. Building on the MRI infrastructure, you can aim targeted sound beams to the size of a cell or smaller and eliminate diseased tissue without damaging anything adjacent. It felt to me like a Star Trek episode. So a little bit about it for those of you that are unfamiliar. What's the principle? Multiple intersecting beams of ultrasound focused accurately to the submillimeter level. The beams pass through the body without damaging tissue, and they can have a profound effect at the targeted point of convenience. And focused ultrasound, since it emerged on the scene decades ago, in the last several years, is now being clinically tested for things like prostate cancer, breast cancer, Alzheimer's, fibroid tissue, Parkinson's, Another dimension of this, the use of what they refer to as microbubbles, which are tiny bubbles, smaller than a blood cell. What's the idea of that? Well, if you can infuse the body with microbubbles and then target the ultrasound beams to the exact locations so that the payload is released, you can conceivably cure diseases without damaging and toxidifying all the adjacent tissue in the entire body. Here's an example. Here's a gentleman with an essential tremor about to get a focused ultrasound treatment. This is the way he draws. This is the way his brain looks. Uh, he's awake. There's no incisions, no chemotherapy, no radiation, no blood clots, no blood da uh, brain damage. And this is what the man looks like after the treatments. I would have to tell you that as Focus Ultrasound progresses, and there's 59 manufacturers right now, I think the leading one, Incitec, many people from Incitec in Israel are on this call. If this progresses, it will render much of we, what we've gotten used to as chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery as barbaric techniques of the past. This could be a breakthrough we've all been dreaming of. You may not be able to read this chart clearly, but if you go to the Focus Ultrasound website, you'll see it. These are all the conditions, there's about 160 now, that throughout the world are moving their way through preclinical and pilot trials and clinical trials and even FDA approvals and reinsurance, insurance reimbursement. Imagine being able to have cancerous tissue or damaged brain tissue repaired or removed without having to be treated with chemotherapies and surgeries and horrible radiation treatments. Last, 
I want to remind us that social engagement is a variable in creating healthy longevity. We often leave it out when we try to be clinically intelligent and we focus on pharmaceuticals or mechanical or biometric technologies. Social engagement. Do people really want to be youthful or do they want to be useful? And I think both. I'll give you an example. Right before COVID, I spoke at a conference and the other speaker was Harrison Ford. And I never met Harrison Ford before, obviously a famous actor, and he's an environmental activist. And he challenged the audience. He said, we've got to get young people all over the world planting trees to save the planet. And he got a standing ovation. And I had a private meeting with Harrison Ford after that. And I said to him, great speech, loved your movies. Hey, do you know there's a billion people over the age of 60 in the world today and nobody's tasked them with anything? Have we created in our short-lived world an absence of a role for older adults? Might they be our mentors? Might they be our emotionally intelligent guides? Might they be our volunteers? Do we need an elder corps? And will people be healthier if they have a more active and contributing role? This comes out of a recent age wave study with Edward Jones, and it's a little hard to track, but I'll tell you that we asked, how do you define success? Achieving wealth, having a career you're proud of, having a positive impact on your family and others, and being happy with who I am and what I'm doing. And we see that as people get older, their interests move away from wealth or career, and they begin to define success as who I am as a person and how I can contribute and make a difference in the life of others. And maybe that's a piece of the longevity equation we could pay even more attention to. It's also important that studies are now showing that people who have a sense of purpose reduce their risk of Alzheimer's and cardiovascular disease and depression, stroke, and disability. And those with a higher purpose have better overall health, greater cognitive functioning, higher life satisfaction, increased mobility and functioning, and even longer lifespans. In our recent study, an extraordinary result emerged. 89% of Americans now feel that there should be more ways for retirees to use their talents and knowledge for the benefit of their communities and society at large. So there is a win-win. Having older adults have a more socially engaged role, cause them to feel better, to enjoy their later years more, and to give back to society. Here's an example of a simple little program, but I think hits the point well. Hello. Hello, hello. Melissa. Hi, Dick. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? How are you today? I'm good. How are you? It's, it's the I, first uh, time that I'm talking with someone from another, another country. I'm very excited to be doing this. I look like I'm only 25. But, but I'm, I'm 88. <laughs> I'm live with my old brother. He has 23 years. Do you know, instead of saying he has 23 years, you could say he is 23 years old. I tried to go to Lulapalooza that we have next week, I think, in Brazil, but my mom didn't let me. Uh, you got a good mom. <laughs> Good morning, dear Julia. Good morning to you. This is your dad? That's me and my wife when we were young. Oh, you were good looking when you were young. And you're still good looking. <laughs> if you could just dream and have whatever you want, what, would, what do you think you would like to be doing? I see myself in a big family, you know, with a beautiful wife. You know. I want to thank you for this change of experience, you know. You are incredible. Abracado. You are my new granddaughter, and I love you. I love you too. And if you were here, I would give you a big hug. Oh yeah, let's hug. Oh. Bye. Yeah, I love that clip, and I love that program. Uh, by the way, there's a similar program that emerged here that I've been involved with called Eldera. You can look it up on the internet, Eldera, 
where older adults can be mentored together with young children all around the world to help uh, provide some support, some encouragement, uh, and friendship, and good for everyone. So where are we? We've got to learn to match our health span to our lifespan, and we've got some very profound changes to make to our healthcare system, to our wellness system, to our scientific community, and to the speed with which we make changes. And let's also not forget the importance of social connectivity. And, at least from where I sit, if we live longer lives, but we don't match our brain span to our lifespan, that rise of cognitive illness, Alzheimer's and related dementias, could become the sinkhole of the 21st century. And not only do we need to beat that with you know, finger study kinds of activities, stress management, proper diet, taking down the inflammation, but we need, like Jonas Salk would say, we need to stop the disease. And a big shout out to my friend George Vradenberg, co-founder of Us Against Alzheimer's, for attempting to make that happen, along with many other organizations. So the time has come for a new era of health and healthcare. I'd like to see healthy longevity for everyone. You know, what could 80 look like? Uh, this gentleman when eight, was 80 when his picture was taken, and, you know, he looks pretty good. He'd won some medals at a previous Olympic or athletic event of some sort. But this guy was 80 when his picture was taken. And I'm going to show you a clip from decades ago, but it's one of my favorites. I run 17 miles every morning. People ask me how I keep my teeth from chattering in the wintertime. I leave them in my locker. So, Susie, let me come back to you and let's see what kinds of questions you or our, uh, our various participants might have as we look at the future of health, medicine, aging, and longevity in a post-COVID world. Thank you so much, Ken. That was an enlightening and passionate presentation. I definitely now have a better plan on how to enjoy my next few decades, and I hope everyone on this webinar does too. I can feel your excitement on how focused ultrasound and its disruptive technology can significantly impact care for the aging population and provide medical excellence and precision medicine, like you said. Um, as a neuroradiologist, I can appreciate how that MR-guided focused ultrasound system by Insight Tech is now one of over actually 63 focused ultrasound manufacturers that can provide therapy with either ultrasound, MRI, X-ray, and even neuro-navigational guidance. So it is a super exciting time. Um, I know we only have a few minutes, but we have a few really good questions. Um, and the first one I just wanted to get everybody involved in this one is, you mentioned so many different areas on how we need to change the system, but can you give the audience maybe one or two action items to, to really help get involved and help change their lives or the whole system? So what advice can you give everybody listening on the web right now? So I've watched every debate leading up to every presidential election for the last 20 years. And the topic of how do we create healthy longevity for all has not come up once. And it's not been asked by any of the news media, the people running for president have talked about insurance, this or distribution of access to that, but not about creating a new science, a new healthcare field to create healthy longevity. It's outrageous to me. It's outrageous to me. It's outrageous to me that AERP earned a billion dollars in commissions last year from backing United Healthcare, which is a fine firm, but they have not taken an aggressive stand towards making sure our medical system is geriatric competent. Uh, I just feel like we've been sitting around and hoping that things will get better. We need to make sure that our leaders, we need to make sure that our physicians, we need to sure our scientists, our young people are aiming towards a future in which we're living a hundred or so years and we have purpose throughout those years and we're as healthy as we can possibly be. Jim Freeze back at Stanford used to call it the compression of morbidity. It's time that we need a new vision and a new fight and a new rebellion Boston Women's Health Collective, where are you when we need you? I just feel like there's too much, you know, infighting about this thing or that thing or this politician was mean to that politician. It's like, excuse me, 
we're all falling off a cliff here. And uh, it's time we created a healthier version of longevity. By the way, I do want to say that while I have no actual relationship with the Focus Ultrasound Foundation, I think that everybody ought to pay more attention to the technologies you guys are sitting on and to the incredible amount of clinical research that now exists and to the fact that for many conditions, it's reimbursable uh, in countries all over the world. So there's a breakthrough waiting to be publicized and to be known more about. And I know we're at the end of our time, so maybe only just one question. And am I right that this presentation will be posted on YouTube within a day? So if people have I would say to everybody, find 10 people on your list that you think ought to think about this topic differently and send it to all 10 of those people. Uh, we got to spread the word. And, you know, young people know how to do that. But, you know, maybe it's about Kim Kardashian and Pete Davidson. We need to be spreading the word about things that really matter for all of our lives and our parents' lives. Oh, my gosh, Ken, you gave us so many good ideas and, and you're inspiring me and I'm sure everybody on this uh, on this webinar to do something and get involved and to help affect change for us and, and future generations. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, if your question wasn't answered, um, and if you want more information, visit our website, theflussfoundation.org and, and Ken's website, agewave.com. Um, thank you to the Agewave organization and Ken for working with our Fuss Foundation staff to present this event. I wanna also thank our IT department and Paige and other support staff uh, that were instrumental in today's webinar. And to everyone on the call, thank you for joining us today and stay tuned to our newsletter and website for invitations to future webinars and events. And as Ken says, let's stay youthful and useful. And I want you to make a t-shirt with that. And I want to start <laughs> selling the t-shirt. One so last thing, I want to give a big shout out to Dr. Neil Cassell, who built this foundation and not so that he could become a billionaire, but so that he could heal the world. Uh, we need more people like Dr. Cassell. And you. All right. Thank you. thank you, everybody. Have a great day.